Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start today's video with a story about the unexpected consequences of not listening and the sweet victory of meticulous communication. But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. You want me to put it in writing? Oh, I'll put it in writing. I used to work IT tech support for a large company, and it was my first proper job. As such, I started as an apprentice. This story takes place about a year into my apprenticeship, so I still had much to learn. On this particular week, I was working the shift that started an hour earlier than everyone else, as I was solely responsible for support before everyone else arrived at 9 a.m. My manager sent me on a job quite a few miles south. It was going to take two-ish days. On Monday, I informed my manager I'd be leaving Wednesday afternoon and coming back Friday afternoon, and he'd need to cover my shift. It isn't my responsibility, and I didn't need to say anything, but I thought I'd help him out by giving him a nudge. Me. Mike? Not real name. I'm on early this week, so someone will need to cover my shift Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Mike. Cheers, mate. It came to Wednesday, and I suspected he hadn't arranged anything, so I thought I'd give him another nudge, genuinely trying to help the guy out. Me. Mike, just letting you know that my early shift will need covering for the rest of the week. Mike. Ah, right you are. Thanks, pal. So off I went on the Wednesday, thinking I was doing a great job and keeping everyone in the loop. We knocked the job out of the park and finished by Thursday evening, so I head to the hotel and enjoy some sweet, sweet expenses. Friday morning, I head out in a rental they'd given me for the trip and start the journey back to head office. I get a call from my manager, Mike. Where are you? Me, heading back. I've just set off. I'll be back in the... Mike, I don't see anything in your calendar. Me, I didn't put anything in it. I told... Mike, the finance director came in this morning and couldn't access the system and you were supposed to be here for 8 a.m. Me, I told you... Mike, speak to me when you get back. The finance director happens to be my boss's boss's boss. Not a dude you want to piss off. And he was pissed off. Turned out his network cable had somehow come loose, kicked, and couldn't access the network. He sat stewing from 7 a.m. expecting someone to arrive by 8 and fix it, only to have no one turn up until 8.45. The head of IT, my boss's boss, who took a fair few expletives on the chin. I arrived back at the office as planned, expected, and informed Friday afternoon. My manager calls me over and gives me a lecture on the importance of communication. I tell him, me, I told you Wednesday I'd be back Friday afternoon and my shift would need covering. He couldn't even look at me as he says the following in the most condescending manner possible, loud enough for the head of IT to hear, Mike, I don't know, Jam and Cream, I've got a pretty good memory and I do not recall that conversation. Then sends me to the head of IT who gives me a bit of a sterner lecture on the importance of communication. The word disappointed was mentioned. I go back to my desk defeated. My victory in the South quashed and sullied. My manager finishes the barrage. Mike, next time, put it in the calendar and tell everyone in writing. The words ricocheted around my mind for a while until they settled and sat imprinted in my brain. I chalked this up to a learning experience and carried on. Fast forward a few months later, the words lay dormant until a bizarrely similar situation occurs. I was sent on a job for a few days and was returning once again on a Friday afternoon, and it just so happened to fall in a week when I was doing the early shift. As soon as I heard about the job, the words sprang back into life, put it in the calendar, tell everyone in writing. Now, I could have put the details of my trip into my personal calendar, but I thought, why not enter it in the IT department's shared calendar, which the head of IT is part of, and when telling everyone in writing, surely that means everyone involved the last time. The IT department and, of course, the finance director. So I send off an email to my manager with the IT department, and just for fun, the finance director copied in. Something like, Hi, Mike. As you're already aware, I'll be working down south this week until Friday afternoon. I'm on the early shift, so this will need covering while I'm away. Some of my colleagues asked what that was about, and I informed them about my manager's memory issues. They smirk and continue working. I complete the job and arrive back Friday afternoon, exactly like before. And like before, the finance director came in early, and unbelievably, like before, he had issues getting onto the system. 
choice expletives were shared, words were had, but not with me. I only knew crap had hit the fan when a colleague pulled me to one side and told me why Mike was in such a foul mood. In classic British style, he never said a word to me, and never his silence felt so vindicating. Honestly, thought you were going to get smacked for CCing everyone in, but that's truly glorious. I might add that the finance director needs to stop kicking his cables out, or perhaps understand how to plug a loose cable in? And our second story. Manager trying to throw staff under the bus. I recently started working with an old co-worker and was reminded of a story from the place we worked at 10 years ago. I was a junior slash mid-developer for a mid-sized company. The different managers had been in the company for a long time. They knew the old system and could keep it limping along. They understood the business just because they were there for so long, but they never kept up with the changing technology. None of them understand the newer concepts and refuse to learn anything. The company started to rewrite the app from the ground up using all new technology and good practices. Laziness or not understanding what to do, no one really knew. They would come to the morning meeting, assign the work, take no tasks, but take all the credit at the demos. One thing that was a massive pain point to clients was bulk data loads. Some clients would need over four hours to load the data from that day. This was unacceptable in the new system. We had a prospective client come in. They loved the system, but would not sign on unless we can get data loads down to minutes. Because of the client, we refocused and started work on data loads. The team was myself, two other devs, and my manager. She wanted to be in on this because it was so high profile and figured it would look great for her. The three of us figured she'd just do no work and just demo the features like normal. Wrong. This time, she started to take critical tasks. We each work our tickets, making sure to add plenty of tests and check performances of all the code. Slowly, my manager would hand her work off to us. This was fine with us as we didn't trust her code. At the end of the cycle, we had it down to 20 minutes to load what used to take an hour. This was not good enough. The CTO said we had to get it under 10. My manager jumped on his side and said the work we did was poor and she would fix it. The CTO left. She turned to us and told us we had to figure this out within a week. We noticed right away that it didn't scale correctly. If 10 items took one second, 20 would take four. We all knew what happened. We found the little bit of code my manager wrote. and She was recursively checking data. What was even better is that the entire function was unneeded. We commented out the call and 20 minutes was now seconds. We took the four hour file and loaded in two minutes. We said nothing to my manager and she never asked because she thought we had no chance of figuring it out. I heard her speaking to consultant. She wanted to be the hero and have them all ready to come in and fix our code. The next demo the CTO wanted an update. We told him we had more updates and it should be a little better. We selected the large file and it was done in two minutes. My manager lost her mind. I could see her ready to kill us. If it was fixed, the credit should have been hers. The CTO asked what the fix. I didn't want to hurt my manager anymore. I figured stealing the glory was enough. I replied we just cleaned up the code. That wasn't good enough for my manager. She pressed whose code caused the problem. She had forgotten she has any code in the project since she never finished a task. I smiled and replied, it was your code. Her head exploded. Nothing else was said. The meeting moved on. She pulled me into her office after and started to yell. She could not say anything to the other devs. They had a different manager, but I was under heat. Why did I not tell her? I'm supposed to report to her my findings. How could I make her look like that? I just sat not saying anything. When she was done, I put in my two weeks notice and walked out. Days later, her and the CTO called me in to beg me to stay. I said I'd like to go somewhere with a manager who wants my success, not failure. I still smile thinking about her face when their process ran and telling her that she was the weak link in our group. And our last story. Neighbor wants my private driveway. Okay, so this conversation with the neighbor took place a couple of weeks ago, and I was floored afterwards. We live on a pretty quiet street, and we're the last house at the very end of the cul-de-sac. While quiet, I wouldn't call our street particularly nice, decent blue-collar neighborhood with 50s-era houses and tiny little yards. Most of the houses have one skinny driveway that only fits one car comfortably. 
Two cars if the first pulls up close to the house and the second sticks out in the street a bit. As a result of this, most people also park along the street wherever they can squeeze in. Each house usually gets one or two additional spots this way. This is not the case for our house. Since we're at the end of the cul-de-sac, if we parked a vehicle out front, it would block our neighbor's driveways on two sides. This was a big consideration for us when purchasing our house because having any guests over would create a parking challenge. One of the reasons there's no street parking anywhere near us is because one of the neighbors on the other side of the cul-de-sac uses all the free spaces. Enter into the story our entitled family, EF. Basically, they've lived there since the dawn of time. I don't want to give too many identifying details, but it's a case of multiple generations living in one tiny house because no one can afford to move out. At some point years ago, the garage was converted to living space and the driveway was absorbed into the yard. Because they have no driveway of any kind and because there are so many people living there, there are always six cars parked vertically in the cul-de-sac. As a result, all vehicles turning around on the street have to do a very tight three-point turn and no one else is allowed to park there. They'll ask you to move. I checked the county records and despite their claims, they don't own that damn corner of the cul-de-sac and certainly don't have exclusive rights to all those spots. This is where our Karen comes in. I don't know most of the folks from EF very well, but I actually hung out with Karen from time to time. But since she was a fair bit younger than me and always wanted rides, money, and booze when she came around, I basically stopped spending any time with her. On this particular day, she caught me outside as I was getting into my car. She quickly begins to tell me that she'd gotten a job the month before and was thinking about buying herself a car. Only trouble is there's nowhere left to park at her house, so she wants to know if she could park in our driveway every day instead. Like at the time, we have two cars in two spots. Technically, you can park three, maybe four cars in our driveway, but that's only because we paid to widen our driveway a bit when we first moved in, so we could actually have a guest or two sometimes. We had to do this because EF was taking all the street parking, and now Karen wanted to take my private driveway too. I'm usually a huge pushover, but I was pretty floored she was asking this. I fumbled for the right words, and I hate saying no to people, but got up the courage and straight up told her, no, it wasn't going to happen. I said we had issues with parking as it was, and she should have to figure something else out. She seemed really surprised by this answer, and I could tell she was annoyed with me for saying no. She mentioned she was going to ask another neighbor of ours next, then if she could park in their driveway instead. She did end up getting a new car, but unsurprisingly, I never saw her parked in the other neighbor's driveway either. Instead, she must have talked a family member into getting rid of one of their old cars. I wouldn't know because she unfriended me on Facebook directly after our conversation. I had a good laugh at that. Well, at least they didn't take it further than just cutting communication. I think you scored a win-win this way. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.